I am very excited to have the next two gentlemen on the Sports Card Shop guest line. Uh, you know, one is a legend of the hobby, and one's an extraordinary uh, filmmaker. Uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Mr. Mark Evans. Uh, his uh, uh, films, The Glamour and the Squalor, uh, a biopic about uh, rock DJ uh, Marco Collins, Clay Dream, uh, about the life of uh, uh, master clay animator uh, Will Vinton. And we're going to talk about a new project uh, that he's uh, uh, releasing very shortly. And a man that if you're in the hobby or a card collector, uh, you, 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 he's synonymous uh, in my book. Uh, with the hobby, uh, you know, great artist, uh, Mr. Dick Perez. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks, John. So I, I'll start with this. I think you both kind of share a, a thread in common, uh, and you guys can correct me if if I'm wrong. You both, uh, when you were younger, wanted to be uh, Major League Baseball players. Is, is that right or, or wrong? Oh, yeah. I certainly, <laughs> yep. Go ahead, Dick. Oh, yes, I... I, I uh... I came uh, to this country in 1947 at six years old. And um, one of the things that the, the New York offered for me, me was the game of baseball. It was, uh, it was the mecca of baseball to me uh, as I look back because three teams were here. And you could have a bunch of friends and you had uh, three different teams being favored. Uh, anyway... Uh, you know, I know all the language. I made friends, but uh, it was playing baseball uh, every day. And, 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 that, and I mean, ball, I don't mean in a ballpark so much as uh, these playgrounds that had softball fields, so to speak. And we did that and we even played hardball on, on those things. But uh, that uh, was an introduction. And, and uh, I wanted to be identified with America. And it, it looked like everybody loved baseball. And the, to me, the most American looking, I mean, and I say that in quotes, uh, was Mickey Mantle. Uh, and uh, he was a member of the Yankees and uh, a, another friend who was, I was very close with, was a Yankee fan. And that's how you become fans of something, when, you know, your, your peers and your friends and uh, what's going on. So that's me. Yeah, and, you know, I, my history with baseball is not as interesting as Dick's where, you know, he learned about this whole country through baseball and through Mickey Mantle, uh, you know, as a, as a, as a youngster. Um, I mean, I just grew up playing the game, loved the game. It was what I did with all my free time was I wanted to play baseball. It's funny. I have a, a six year old nephew right now who is following kind of that track. Like you can't hang out with him without him being like, let's go play, pitch to me, you know? And uh, that's how I was as a kid. I was always wanting to play, always collecting cards. Um, and I played through high school. Um, you know, I was a good pitcher, led our league in, in ERA. My senior year, we won the state tournament, state championship. But um, uh, And I had some offers to play in college, but kind of realized at that point it was time to just move on with my life, as tough as, as that was. But um, and, but that that's what it gets me so excited about this project. You know, this is the first um, sports film that I've been making, first baseball film, and it's just great to be kind of back to uh, the roots in that way. Yeah, I, was, I, I know you, you mentioned you collect cards, Mark. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you, you saw Diamond Kings back in the day. Did you have – I mean, obviously I know the answer to this, but to think, you know, uh, that you would be, you know, doing a film about Mr. Perez, here you are with the diamond Kings in hand and, and all these years later, you know, you're going to be doing a, a film uh, pertaining to him. I mean, what's, what's that like? I imagine it's a little surreal and, and, and that, but. Uh, yeah. So, you own... know, as I was collecting as a kid and I, and I grew up and collected in the, you know, the heyday of the diamond Kings, I, I think I started collecting in probably 1987 and 82 was the first year of the diamond Kings. So those were really important cards to me, but to be candid, you know, when you're seven, years old you're not really thinking at that point about who, who painted these right like you just know that this is a cool card and it's king griffey jr or bo jackson or wade boggs and you know my my favorite players so it wasn't until last year my i've got a 12 year old son and he's been he kind of fell in love with baseball really last year um as julio rodriguez came on the scene that was the player he really uh you know enjoyed watching and so he got interested in baseball cards and we were going through my whole collection. And it was then when I, as I was going through and looking at the diamond Kings thinking, 
what's what's the story of Dick Perez, the you know the the the, the artist that painted these and. So that was kind of my, you know, that's when I went to school on the, the life and works of, of Dick Perez and was just blown away, um, you know, obviously not just by the Diamond Kings, but the fact that he's painted the entire history of the game and, uh, you know, 20 plus years as the National Baseball Hall of Fame official painter and official artist of the Phillies for decades. And um, I just thought this is a great story and um, it would be a great, a great film. And uh, so I reached out to Dick, you know, I had been, we didn't know each other. And um, we hit it off and it's been a lot of fun for you know, the past several months making this film and um, really excited for people to see it too, because I think they're going to be really uh, uh, blown away by, by his story. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Dick, you came over, if, if, if I got my facts uh, not crossed up, you came over, like you said, you were six years old from Puerto Rico uh, to, to New York. Did you, am I right? Did you, uh, you were put on a plane by yourself at six? Well, I was put on my, on the plane by my mother and a bunch of yeah. other Puerto Ricans. But, but, uh, what they told me was, look, I don't know. I didn't know the people who were, I didn't, I don't know that I didn't even know what, what I was going to be doing in a plane. But, um, I, they told me that when I get to the other side, stewardess will, take me into the uh, welcoming. At those days, you could come right up to the door of the plane rail, practically. And th these people will know your name. They'll be happy to see you. They'll hug, they'll kiss you, they'll pick you up, and they'll take you with them, go with them. Hmm. And that's what happened. And I get these uh, wonderful people that came with, a, a, one was my aunt, which was a sister of my recently deceased father. And um, she was staying with her aunt in this big house in the Bronx. And, uh, you know, they took me in. And then in about a year later, my mother and my sister followed because we had raised enough fare to get, you know, for them to come. And, you know, we started our life uh, basically from, Brook from the Bronx. We really went for most of my young life into to, to Harlem, to Manhattan where I fell at home and there were a lot of Latinos there. And so, you know, it was, uh, I find it wonderful. I have no, you know, I have no, no, I love the, I love what I love. My first malted milk was introduced to me, which was like unbelievable. Egg cream, snow. I mean, it was, uh, it was a, a wonderland. Uh, so, you know, it was a, a, a thing that, um, I'm sure a lot of other, you know, uh, immigrants, because I, even though we are part of the United States, we still come from another place that doesn't speak the language. So I consider myself in a way an, an immigrant, which is not, you know, it's, it's okay. That's what this country really uh, is um, for the most part composed of. So, um, you know, and my life went on from there. Uh, I, I, uh, I did aspire to play baseball. And for the longest time, I thought I would be doing it like you like you decide to be an engineer and all you got to do is do it. And you might not be the best engineer, but, you know, you're you're an engineer. Well, that doesn't work in baseball. <laughs> you got to be like the best ever. And I and I, I played in some good teams, you know, uh, youth team. I never made my high school team, which should have told me something. But I, I tried for every position, even though I was left handed. I even tried catching. And, uh, you know, it, it, it eventually, and I used to draw too uh, alongside of that. So eventually, uh, instead of playing more and drawing less, I now became, I started to draw more and play less. And uh, I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I didn't plan my future. I didn't plan that I was going to be doing uh, baseball art or anything like that. I just liked to draw. And I did still didn't know what, since I'm not going to be a ball player. What am I going to be? And I never really addressed that. You're a kid. You're a kid, and you don't you don't make those decisions. So uh, that's how I, you know, that's how I grew up. I got to ask you. Like I'm still scared to fly, and I'm 50 years old. You're six years old. I mean, you're like you said. Your mom put you on the plane and, and gave you directions. But I mean, talk about like what's going. You know, at six, you're on a plane by yourself. Is it? Are you scared? Like, what's going through your mind as, as a young man? <laughs> well, what happened was, uh, it's interesting you ask that question, because I get on the plane, they put, it, well, these 
Pan, uh, Pan American, I uh, forget what the name of the, uh, but they were all propeller planes, four, four props on either wing, excuse me, two on either wing. And I was put on a, by the window, sitting there, and I'm looking at these engines going around, and we're in the air, and all of a sudden, one of them stops. And I say, that ain't right. I mean, that, that doesn't seem like something that should happen because, you know, so I was a little apprehensive about that, but I didn't know, you know, I didn't have a fear. I was still little, but it just something that didn't seem right. But that has lived with me. And I too am very apprehensive about flying because of that one little thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have to, I have to take a Xanax usually before uh, I fly. I've gotten better. I've gotten better. Uh, the, the older uh, I, I get and the more right. uh, I, I do it. Mark, you, you're famous for, for doing some great documentaries about some incredible and interesting folks. What is it when, you know, when you got into filmmaking, did you know you want you wanted to, to go down the alley of, of documentaries? Kind of how did that all sort of that that was your lane that you, you, you kind of went into? Yeah, you know, so because I grew up wanting to be a baseball player, I didn't grow up wanting to be a filmmaker or thinking about that. And I kind of stumbled into it. My my older stepbrother, Kevin Noland, um, he, he did grow up wanting to be a filmmaker and he, he's 10 years older than I am. So he he went to college, not not to film school. He went to University of Washington. And then but right after he graduated, he moved to L.A. and he was you know sweeping floors, getting coffees, doing, you know, starting from the bottom in, in that industry. And um and eventually, you know, made some films of his own. He directed his his first feature film was called Americano that starred um, Dennis Hopper and Joshua Jackson. And and uh, so he kind of like opened up some of those doors. And then in 2010 is when really I caught the filmmaking bug because we um, my my stepdad, my my stepbrother's dad passed away. And um, at the same time, pretty much was uh, a big earthquake in Haiti that killed, you know, like 250,000 people. And we just kind of felt this attraction to that place and that story. Um, and so we went down there um, and started making a documentary that we're still making today, 13 years later. Um, there's a reason this will be like about a 15 year project uh, before, mm. before it gets released. And that was my film school. That's where I learned how to shoot, learned how to edit. I raised the money for it. And I just fell in love with doing this thing. And so um, I just went all in. I was looking for stories, looking for things, you know, things to make movies about. And came across the story of Marco Collins, who was a radio DJ, who's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for um, kind of pressing play on the whole grunge music scene that came out of Seattle in 1991. So he was the first to play Nirvana and Pearl Jam and um, Alice in Chains, you know, bands like that. And uh, so that was just an interest. Like I loved that music growing up and I wanted to, I just thought this is a great story. People, more people outside of Seattle should know this name. And it was kind of similar, I think with Clay Dream where you've got this animator that everybody in the animation world knew and loved, but nobody else really knew that story, especially outside of Portland, Oregon. And, um, and I grew up with those characters that Will Vinton had created and so it's, it's a similar thing here with, with, with Dick Perez that, you know, I grew up with these cards and I just had an interest and it was just, you know, on a whim reached out, like just thought this would be a cool story. And, um, and, and fortunately Dick was open-minded to it. And but I think that first call, I think we talked for a couple hours on that first conversation and, and just, it was a good feeling, you know, and we just, just thought, well, yeah, let's see, let's see what happens here. And, um, and it's, and it's been great. So I, it, you know, I think it was just kind of following the curiosities and things that interest me and uh, figuring, you know, there's, there's other people that would be interested in this as well. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, you know, you kind of learned trial by fire, right? You kind of learned in, in doing it. Sometimes that's the best way people will tell you that's the best way to, you know, hone your craft. It's just doing it rather well, than you definitely learn way more, I think with mistakes than you do successes. Right. So, yeah. Uh, Hopefully I got a lot of those out of the way early, <laughs> but yeah. Dick, when, when, what age did you realize like, Hey, I can, I can draw, I can paint. Like for me, my dad's an actual, uh, is a very good artist. I can't draw a stick figure. My son's very good. So it skipped me. It's like every other, when did you personally say, Hey, I, <laughs> I, I enjoy this and I think I'm pretty good at it. Well, I don't think, I don't remember the beginning. I remember doing it all my life. Uh, and mostly they were drawings, just pencil drawings along margins of notebooks. 
of um, caricatures of my classmates and and maybe uh, what I thought Mickey Mantle looked like and uh, things like that. So and then it, it was an evolution uh, that was interrupted by the reality of the fact that how do you make a living doing this? And I know that you can uh, become a, I mean, by that time I was in you know pretty much in high school and all and I and I and I knew there was such things as this graphic design and that I knew that might that's going to give me a job somewhere I hope so I pursued uh, a lot of uh, education in graphic design I only had one painting course in 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 art school and one drawing course in art school the rest of it was all color and design and graphics and typography and and stuff like that. And then I got into the field as that, but the fortuity is that I got, I met people that required illustrations for the public, like the Phillies or Villanova University or the Philadelphia Eagles. And I started toying around. I would buy the, I would hire people to do that for the magazines I was designing for these people, like the yearbooks and so forth. And I started, well, like, let me, and I just kept, you know, fooling around with it. And, uh, I look back on those paintings. I say, "How did I ever think I could go any any further than this?" But I did, and they accepted them. And you know, I just I just kept doing it, and eventually it became the sole, you know, my sole uh, purpose for for being an artist. Now, were, did you? I'm assuming did you collect cards as a young man? You, I know you were a fan of the sport. Was the cards come along with that? Was that a natural? Yeah, I, I think I think those things happen to uh, just about every little kid that that loves baseball. Uh, I think that's why the cards are so successful. And 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 at that time, the tops had a monopoly on 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 the thing. But to me, every spring was like it wasn't just the beginning of the spring training season, but it was when the cards were coming out at the candy stores. And I would be right up to the candy store. Then, and I, I said this before in other interviews that there was a set of cards in the 52s, 53 Bowman, 50, that looked different from the others. I didn't, I didn't immediately think that they were really art; that they were just a different kind of photograph. And uh, as, it, as it was, it, it, they were art cards, and those were the last art cards that that uh, that I ever saw in cards anymore after those early 50s. So there was a, a span of years there where there was no art in, in baseball, which sparkled my mind that once I became involved in sports, that how about that? That that could be a, because, well, there's a long story about Don Russ uh, getting a license to sell cards because the courts overturned Topps' uh, idea that uh, they're the only ones that could do this. So, uh, Don Russ was was a, a a card company, but they know nothing about baseball. They didn't do baseball. They did Elvis Presley TV shows and golfers and stuff of that nature. And um, so when they got the license, they didn't know what to do. Basically, I mean, how? I mean, they knew that they're going to be getting pictures from somebody. They would be hiring photographers, which who they had a license to do. Anyway, they needed to, something to separate the, them from the rest of the pack. And uh, the writer for the back of the cards was Bill Madden, who was a sports writer. And uh, he knew us because he collected the Perez Steel cards that I, that Frank Steele and I were doing before Don Russ got into the picture. And um, the, he was chatting with them and, and, and they, they were talking about what can we do that's different? What, they were trying to explore what, what would identify them as a different card company. And, uh, Bill Mann said, you should talk to Dick Perez and Frank Steele because they do cards, art cards. So in essence, I think Diamond Kings, I could, uh, I think Bill Madden had a lot to do with the, you know, with the idea of Diamond, with the, with the uh, Diamond Kings coming into existence. So anyway, we, we had, we talked, they, they called us and we met them and one thing led to another. And, and uh, before I, I knew it, I was doing, art cards again. And that was my whole purpose. Now you, you were, you were allowed to pick uh, who was depicted on the cards, right? They didn't tell you 
we want these players. You were given that sort of poetic. Yeah, they, they had no idea who you know <laughs> who uh, Lenny Dykstra was, or they. Uh, it was uh, uh, they gave it to Frank and me to do since yeah. you know since we you know and one time I think even Bill Madden might have been involved in it, but I don't think he wrote the cards for very long, and uh, so Frank and I would decide a year before what's going to be the Diamond King for whatever. For whoever in the in the following year. So we had a half a year, half a season, the, the prior year of the car, of the actual card coming out, which there were some people, some players who had old, you know, had had identified themselves having having a good year. And they continued to do that for fortunately for us, for except for a, a couple of them that we had to change at the last minute. But it was that. And it was the fact that some of these teams had their own stars. I mean, Johnny Bench, and, you know, Steve Carlton, Mike Schmidt, they're shoo-ins for, for being a Diamond King. They were already established careers. So we never had a uh, – I think I read something the other day that said some of these players were nothing. I mean, they, they, nothing happened to them later. But they had a good year before. The, and one guy was that – I forget, Mark, you might remember the name of the Baltimore Oriole guy that had the fantastic year – and he was on on, on PD, PD, you know, and then uh, then he somehow he got caught and he went back down into the toilet. So uh, anyway, uh, we 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 he and I talked about it. We researched it, and then we told Don Russ uh, send us as many pictures as you can of these guys, because I I wanted I didn't want them to send me one picture and that's what I'm going to paint. I was going to either make them up with a lot of pictures or or choose one that was ideal. So they did that, and um, the style of illustration was totally in my hands. No matter what I did, they never said anything, and uh, you know they never said I don't. I think that's too unrealistic or whatever, and they never interfered. And it, it was a great, great run for me. I mean, I to be to have that you know that acceptance. I got to ask the 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 moniker, the name Diamond King. There was that something you came up with? Who who came up with coin diamond? Yeah, Frank Steele actually came up with that. He we were going to name it Diamond Stars, and then but I think they I think he said no. I mean, I just found out in the thirties there was a card card set called Diamond Stars. Mm -hmm. So we toyed around, and I I he thought well Diamond Kings, you know, and I yeah that's fine. That sounded good to me, and uh, yeah he came up. He actually was the one that came up with Diamond Kings. But he couldn't draw. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was the the brains behind the operation. Yeah, saying. right. When, did, when you're doing these, did you did you know then like the significance this would be uh, in in the hobby? Did you have any sort of clairvoyance? Did you did you know the impact, or or were you were you working and enjoying the the process? No, not at all. I I just thought that. Uh, you know, people will accept it. They'll look at it. They'll talk of it among each other and all that. But not, I don't think it was going to become a collector phenomenon. Uh, so that, in fact, through the 15 years, I think, something like that, that I did them, I never got a, a, a letter from anybody saying, I love this work or whatever. You know, they, and, and I was getting fan mail from other things, from the Perez field part. And so I just accepted the fact that, okay, they, you know, they, I, I know that I was doing something special, but then I'm sure other people did too. And uh, it was after these kids who collected these cards grew up, email was, was around now. They got married like Mark and had a child. And all of a sudden there was this, this common ground that, that and not only just sons, but daughters too. I get email. I mean, uh, well, emails too. But I get, I get un, a lot of uh, uh, fan mail that asking me to sign cards and stuff. And I get them from all over the place. And I get story, family stories that that will break your heart because the father is collecting with his son because he's terminally ill. And you know, then I get a letter telling me when he had passed. And, but I mean, this is the kind of connection that. I never would imagine that would, would be happy. I even got a, uh, and I think I showed it to Mark, a letter from a guy who was a murderer in prison 
And he was, he, I think he wanted, he wanted cards to sell. He, he wanted to send me a bunch of cards that, you know, that was given to him. And I, and I, I don't know he was a murderer for, for sure, but he was in for about 25 years and he had 63 to go. So, so I mean, that's a, you know, and he was some, I don't know, some Southern prison. And he told me, and he said that he, you know, he killed animals and he did, in his letter. It was a great letter. Obviously. So, but I mean, these are the kind of things that, um, aside from, you know, the, the intent, you know, the actual intent was that I'm doing baseball cards and I'm, I'm introducing something new to the collecting since, since 1952. Uh, it never dawned on me that it would do this. And then you get the call from a guy who is one of those guys who makes films. And he wants to make a film for, of me. And there he is. And, you know, so, so it's just part of the fortuity of my life. Everything, everything that's happened to me is because I met the right people at the right time. And all I did was be reliable and do my best. And that, and that took care of itself. Everybody asked, you know, the Phillies asked, the, I did start it with the Eagles. The Phillies asked the Eagle who was doing their work because they would, they would like me to do it too. And it, it just, you know, you just get, I met Frank Steele uh, through the NFL. And uh, so, and that, you know, that's, that really, that really did a lot for me. So a lot of it was luck. And then you have to take, do something with that luck, you know, and, and I hope I did. Well, I'm sure there was, there was some hard work in there uh, to Dick. And, and so Mark calls you to, to do this film. Uh, like initially, do you like, are you wondering like who's play, you know, you hear movie, right? We all play that game, right? If there was a movie about my life, who would play, who would play me? Did you do, <laughs> did you do any of that at all? Not no, no, he, he, he was uh, from the start. He, I knew what, what he was <laughs> looking for. And uh, because I've had a number of interviews uh, and one interview just led to another request. And uh, I knew there was a story there, but I think the story is, you know, I'm trying to separate myself from the story. But the story, as as it, it as I see it, is an immigrant kid, art, baseball, art and baseball, and a love for the game. I mean, there's just a number of things there that that uh, go together, and inspired me. And uh, you know, I, I, it was it, and there was some there was there was somebody out there who really appreciated. Now, it is a good question, though, Dick. If, if let's say this documentary gets turned into a feature film with an actor. Who plays Dick Perez? Probably Brad Pitt if he dyes his hair. You know, I, um, God, I don't know. Me. <laughs> I would like to do it. I'll dye my hair. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, Mark, you know, in doing documentaries, especially when someone is, is still around, thankfully, is there is there any difficulties in that? Do people sometimes maybe not want to talk about things and you want to you want to tell the whole story, right? You want to be as accurate and, you know, is is there difficult? You know, when we see the finished product, it looks seamless and, and easy sure. uh, as viewers. But as someone in the process and making making these films, uh, maybe not even with Dick, but some of even the prior stuff, is there difficulties uh, with that sometimes? Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, and it depends on the project and the subject for sure. Um, you know, my, my first film, uh, you know, I, I, it was the first film and I didn't, I, I probably should have been more collaborative with the subject. And, uh, but I'd always been told like, you don't show anything cause you know, you don't show the subject anything. And so I kind of was just following those rules. And, and, and then I realized, you know what, I kind of wish I would have had them more involved. So they weren't like scared about what was going to happen. And in that film, you know, there was a lot of conflict in that story. And, um, and from the beginning though, we had decided we're not going to shy away from any of that. And, and we didn't. Um, and then in, in clay dream, um, you know, when I started that film, the subject Will Benton was alive and he passed away during the making of that, which, you know, I didn't expect. Um, and I don't know if that film ended up being any different, that, you know, because of that. Um, you know, I certainly was continuing to make the film that I wanted to make. There might have been some people that were maybe not wanting to talk, maybe didn't want to talk to me during for an interview. Uh, but then once he passed, they thought, OK, well, you know, I, I'm, I can tell this story now. I didn't really want to tell it, but I but I wasn't looking for, you know, like gotcha moments. And then with this story, uh, you know, and getting to know Dick, it, you know, we we 
you know, I, I realized really early, like, you know, this isn't a story that ha that I'm going to try to like manufacture conflict or drama. It's just an inspirational story. I mean, he's, um, his, his true life story is inspiring and, uh, right, right down to the fact that, um, you know, he's been married to his wonderful wife, Lou for 50 plus years. And, um, so that's just, you know, the film that we're making and, um, and, and, and my, you know, the previous one that I made what did have a ton of conflict and I, you know, I wasn't looking to, you know, do the same thing, but just in the, in the, in the baseball art world, you know. You know, you spoke, uh, uh, you know, with your answer, you spoke sometimes with the, the difficulties of, of a movie where maybe someone doesn't want to say something or comment. This one you mentioned kind of, it was, you know, more of a happier story, if you will. I don't know if that's the right words is is you know do you have a preference or just it's what comes with the territory yeah i think every every project is different um and every subject is different and uh finding what the best version of that story is again you, you do have to kind of find that on every project and um you know we we could we could look to try to you know this story hypothetically it's like we could look to try to create conflict in certain ways but it's like that's not the best version of the story anyway so um, whereas, you know, the last film I could have decided to avoid the, the conflict that was there in that story. And that wouldn't have been the best version. So it just, it's just spending time with it and, and figuring out, um, what's, what's real, what's authentic and what serves the, the story in the film the best way and the subject. Yeah. And, and another question, piggybacking off that you don't have to mention names, obviously. Have you ever had someone you wanted to do a collaboration, a film? with or about and they just didn't want they didn't want to do it or be a part of it i mean i've definitely had um interview uh like subjects that i've wanted to interview for a film about somebody else that i was hoping to get and that never came around i mean that that happens um and then yeah i mean there's there's been some people that i've thought oh this would be, be a great film that i've reached out to and we've had some conversations and for one reason or another you know it hasn't gone anywhere um and yeah, and that happens too, but no, nothing, you know, no stories where it's just like, oh my gosh, you got to hear this. Um, just things that, that come with the territory. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, back to Dick, Dick, and then you went, you went in and you, you know, I don't know if I know this, but I, there might be some people who don't, I don't know how, but it, it does happen. Not everyone's <laughs> aware, you know, you did uh, the Topps Turkey Red uh, artwork uh, as well. So kind of speak, uh, you know, this is obviously post Diamond Kings. Your your time with Donruss and, and Diamond Kings. How how did that come about? Well, uh, at the time, and I think they're still doing it. Tofts uh, was playing homage to a, a number of car designs of the past. I thought that was great because this is what Frank Steele and I. That's what we intended to do. We we the the productions that we did. The celebration set, the Hall of, Hall of Fame art postcard, the great moments, and a few others, they were all based on the design cards of the past. So we were honoring and paying homage to design, uh, uh, to car, to baseball cards. And Top was already, Top was doing that. And they came to me to do a oh, terrible project. Little two by one art, you know, to, for collectors. And and I would do these little paintings, which are terrible. I mean, a hard time doing them. And uh, that was the first thing that I did. And then they they every the ideas were all theirs. And they said to me, uh, "We're we're trying to to do a card set of the Turkey Reds actual side." And I said, "Well, I'm, I'm ready." And he said, "They said okay." And they we picked 51 players, and we were talking, and time is passing by. And, and uh, the top said, you know, maybe we should get you some help with this. And I said, excuse me? I said, no, no. If you want, it, uh, either you want to get other players, then other uh, artists, well, then you just make the whole thing other artists. But if you're going to want me to do it, I want to be the guy that does the whole thing because I, I would like the consistency of one style and, and I have a great affinity. That is my favorite card set of all time is the turkey red, even though they're, you know, they're outside. But they were wonderful period paintings there, and I tried to. So the, the rest of it was left up to me. I, you know, I'm putting putting behind them a scene of a ballpark that the team that they play for now 
you know, like uh, uh, I mean, uh, Alex Rodriguez, okay, the Yankee. He's 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 in front of the of the Highlander Park in New York, uh, and I did that with with just about it, all the players, um, and and it was it was probably the best my best thing for them uh, was that that particular set because it was happened to be my personal best card set. So uh, you know, you know, you're a pioneer when it comes to to card art. We've seen tops in the last few years really sort of revisit that with the the tops project 2020, the spotlight 70. Uh, I've had those some of those artists, uh, half of the project 2020 artists have been on this very podcast mm -hmm. and many of them sort of point to you, Dick, as sort of the inspiration Whoa, or, or where good. they get, yeah. you know, what do you think of where card art is today uh, in relative to, you know, where it was? Is it, is it, you know, what's your, your thoughts on, on, on the present day? Well, I think the more the better. I think, I think uh, it's not going to be what it used to be where you had the entire roster of base, you know, rosters of baseball teams uh, painted, uh, but but I think it's at subsets and special cards within the, the the actual set. I think it's fine, and it just means. I mean, the last thing that I would do if my son or daughter came to me and said I want to be a professional artist, I would say, why? <laughs> you know, it's like it's 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 an unsure future. You you know, how do you do that? It's like saying I want to be an actor. I want to be a lead actor in a movie in movies. Well, that's almost the same kind of thing. Uh, so it's nice that that artists are getting work, and artists who who like baseball, and also like to 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 do, to do art. So they're like versions of me out there, uh, so to speak, enjoying the same thing that I enjoyed when I was doing what I was doing. Yeah, no doubt, and 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 like I said, uh, some of them have, have distinctively pointed to you and, and paid homage to you know, giving credit uh, to you. Um, I, I meant to ask this earlier. Knowing you sort of picked the players to, to be depicted on the Diamond Kings, you did. Have you ever had a player politic for themselves, like, "Hey, am can, am I going to be in the Diamond King set uh, anytime soon? Do you ever have that happen?" No, it never happened, and that's probably the reason I never thought. You know, I, if there were good things to do, but it wasn't ha having any impact anywhere. So uh, I think. Uh, let me see. Yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't. You, you I did have some oh yeah, the only con react to Diamond Kings, though, right? Pardon me. You did have some players react to the Diamond Kings. Yeah, I did, and and one of them was, which is amazing. It just taught me how 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 much players pay attention to themselves, but. Uh, I did a Diamond King, I believe, of uh, uh, John Crook, right? Yeah, Crook, who who was in the San Diego uniform, but I, he was playing for the Phillies, so I just changed the uniform. And he just re remembered the batting pose that you know, and it was a pose shot. It wasn't a, a game shot, which would identify, help him identify it better. And he said, "You know, you painted me with a with a wrong uniform, and you just changed it, didn't you?" And, I, and this was at an art, art art exhibit that he attended that I had in in Philadelphia, and I say, yeah, you got a problem with that? I mean, it's like, it's, who knows? Do you and I know are the only people who know now? And uh, that, and um, I've had players comment, not necessarily Diamond Kings, but I think Raleigh Fingers um, looked at me and said, "You see that painting you did of me?" And I say, "Yeah." I said. You have a, a, a sign in the back for the number of feet, which is in center field, and it's only like 340 feet. If I pitched in a ballpark that had a center field of 300, I wouldn't be in this building. <laughs> so I said, well, I, I'm sure it was in the photo, and I couldn't find a photograph to prove it to him. And of course, Joe DiMaggio also, he, he, had, he was full of <laughs> complaints. But he had one where I did a painting of him and, and, and uh, the collector – with a friend of his and showed it. And he said, if I have a song like that, my God, I never. So <laughs> they came back to me and I said, I, I took it right from the photo. I mean, he did that. So I produced the photo and I, and I sent it to the guy and, and then he, he, he sent me a magazine that had him on the cover that he's from 1950s. It's that, that he autographed for me. 
But but other than that, he was still a real, you know, piece of work. That guy. <laughs> well, did, didn't he have a policy that he wouldn't sign any press? Yeah, uh, the, the, the an autobiography, not an autobiography. It was a biography of him that tells uh, in one of, the, one of the chapters what he doesn't sign. Like he doesn't sign uniform, he doesn't sign glove. You know, he does a litany of, of things that are hard to hold and, and write on, I guess. And he said, and then one of the things that was Dick Perez work, you know, Perez steals stuff. He wouldn't sign any of that. He, he, what he, the, the story was that he, he called my friend, my partner, Frank, and he said to him, listen, I've got a, a complaint. I, I, I went walking on Main Street in, in Cooperstown and I saw this card that you did of me, and it was selling for three hundred and fifty-five dollars, and it was autographed by me. And I want to know where's my share of that. And Frank said, "You don't understand. This card is three hundred and fifty-five or seventy-five dollars because you signed it. The card actually was worth fifty cents. We, you know, because we when we printed them all together and all that, the, the per price per card was was minuscule." And he said, so so $50, 50 cents, you know, just like you and Billy Herman. He said, well, Billy Herman, you, you made a card and selling it for the same price as Billy Herman? Then you couldn't help him. You couldn't, you couldn't, you know, get him from, from away from himself. Yeah, you know, everyone's got a different size ego, I, I suppose. Some, yeah, are, yeah. some are apparently bigger, bigger than, than others. Uh, Mark, uh, kind of coming down the home stretch here. Uh, talk about this film, like the process. I don't want to, you know, don't give out any trade secrets or, or any of that stuff. But, you know, uh, was it easier to make, what, you know, with a subject like Mr. Perez, where maybe, you know, he's easy going and, and, and how long does the process take? And then, you know, when, when can, uh, you know, people who want to see this film, uh, when can we expect uh, to see it? Yeah. So, I mean, the process has been really great working with Dick. He's been a great collaborator. Um, we have a lot of fun every time we shoot and it's just been great. And that's certainly not always the case. Sometimes people can be difficult. And uh, this, this has been great. Um, we, we got started. I think the first time we started shooting was last August. Uh, my, my previous two feature films both took about five years and I was specifically looking for a project that I could do in a way that um, wasn't going to be a five-year project. Where, where at first I thought, okay, this project with Dick Perez, maybe, maybe Dick will be the only person that I interview for the film, um, which my previous films, I interviewed 50 people for each. Um, and that takes you around the country and it takes time and it costs a lot of money. Um, I, I have started interviewing some other people. Jo uh, John Thorne, the uh, official historian of major league baseball provided a great interview for this film among some others. So I, I have gotten beyond that a little bit, but, um, but it's, it's pretty cool to see what we've done, you know, just since August and uh, right now we have a Kickstarter campaign that um, is, is live. And uh, so I'd encourage all your listeners and, and viewers to check that out because that will help us fund basically the rest of the film so we can, we can get it finished. The film itself will be out sometime in 2024. Um, so by the time we finish shooting and then the editing and all that, it just, and, then, and then putting it through distribution. But this Kickstarter campaign, it has some really great rewards that people can participate in uh, in exchange for a pledge. The one I think we're probably most excited about is there's a new Dick Perez card set that uh, he designed. He's doing new paintings for um, you got a little sneak peek of what will be the Tom Seaver. Uh, there's a, there's a Shohei Otani and Aaron judge, uh, Julio Rodriguez. So brand new paintings of current players and then players from the past, you know, starting from Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and Roberto Clemente. Um, so people they're, they're limited and there's only 499 sets. Um, so people will probably want to jump on that, but um, that's one of the handful of rewards that we're offering as part of this campaign. And I'll make sure to get that in the episode notes as well, uh, Mark. That way people can get over there, support the project, uh, get some maybe cards uh, uh, in the process. It's a win-win, right? You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're helping the film uh, to, to get done. And if you're a card collector... Uh, you're gonna maybe get uh, some cards out of that, uh, depending on what you know, what level you you enter in on. But whatever the case may be, it, it's nice because it's sort of interactive. You almost feel like maybe a small part 
uh, of the of the film as well. Yeah, that's what I love about you know Kickstarter or crowdfunding is you do find an audience that wants to help support this project, and they do become part of the team. And then when the film is out, they're generally the ones that you know they've been part of this process and they want to tell their friends about it. So um, I, I've always had a good experience. I, I've done this with all my projects in the past, and I've just found it's a good way to um, build build the team out a little bit. Yeah, no doubt. And like I said, I'll make sure that gets in the uh, that uh, URL gets in the uh, episode notes. So uh, uh, if you want to give it out though verbally as well, I'll put it in there, uh, written you know in, in type form. But uh, uh, where can they go to to find that? Yeah, I mean the the best thing will to be to click the link because they probably kind of have a lot of numbers. But it's 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 a Kickstarter campaign, so it'll be on Kickstarter.com, and then the uh, film title is The Diamond King. Uh, yeah. Which, which is suitable, right? For, for so if, if they set, if they search Diamond King, it should it should pop it up. And yeah, but we'll be sending the actual link out. Everywhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I'll like I said, I'll get that uh, uh, in the show notes. Well, gentlemen, this has been uh, an honor and a privilege to to, to speak with both of you uh, today. Uh, for me, as a you know someone in the hobby for forty years myself, uh, Dick, to, you know. Uh, you know, you don't envision even when you start a podcast, even five years ago, right? You don't assume you're going to get the the opportunity to talk to the certain people who were instrumental in your hobby journey, and 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 that happened today. So uh, I want to thank uh, both you gentlemen. I look forward uh, to the film for sure. I know many others uh, will as as well, and and not just not just hobbyists or, or collectors, but I think just fans of of art or uh, like you, like you said, Mark, a great story, right? You can you can come over, you can be an immigrant and be a, a huge success, and and be an inspiration uh, to many others, as Mr. Perez is uh, to many people, not just in the art world, but just in, in general. And I think that's a, a great message that I'm sure will be uh, conveyed in the film. I, I'll give you guys both uh kind of the final words any any websites or anything you want to uh steer people uh to uh, by all means take your time dickperez.com is uh you can get lost in there for for days it's great <laughs> you know a lot of his work is posted there um and i find myself you know I'll, i i go back to it all the time because i'm always just you know kind of thinking about um you know inspiration for new ideas so i'll i'll, I'll scroll through his site uh, and then if you if you don't have his book yet which came which I, I, I don't know when you released the first immortals and then the supplement but the immortals uh book that dick has put together is it, it's an amazing coffee table book and um any baseball fan every baseball fan should own that book so other than our kickstarter campaign i, I'll, I would direct people to those sites <laughs> yeah I, yeah my website is fine it's great because i i think um you know it, it's got all the plays I painted, and you, when you look at the collection of them, it's it's a lot of people that some of them people won't even know. But I was what what I got out of this this particular program is that I knew that I was what I was doing was something I was bringing art back to baseball. But I think with your conversation, John, was that uh, you were talking to a number of artists, which means I brought artists also back to baseball. So I learned that. I mean, I didn't. I wasn't thinking about that, but it, it's nice to know that 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 I might have played a part in in some of that. Yeah, no, very true, and that's not lip service. That was that was them uh, stating that. I mean, you you're sort of the the godfather of of the. I know there's been other artists, and I'm not you know trying to, but uh, you're sort of like really brought it to the forefront and uh, uh, you know made it mainstream, if you will, as it as it should be, and. Uh, uh, you know, I always tell people, right, all cards are sort of little works of, of art in themselves. But when you actually have art be part of the card, even, even, even you know, amplifies that uh, even more. So, uh, uh, again, thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you making some time for the show. And uh, maybe love to have you back on, too. Once, uh, once the movie's out, we can kind of revisit and, and, and talk about that. And I, I definitely look, uh, mm -hmm. will be watching it. So be good. Thanks, John. It's fun. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Bye-bye.